All right. So, and a, a few announcements. So, when if you leave, make sure that you leave the 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 place clean. Uh, and um, um, what else was important? <laughs> Oh, yeah, and very importantly, if you go go back to your camps uh, or home, just share with your friends, uh, you know, what you learned today, and hopefully that this information cannot just stay here, but also if, uh, educate people uh, abroad. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about a space that exists between worlds, the indigenous world of uh, plant medicine use, the spiritual religious uh, worlds no, uh, exist, that exist for about 100 years that have incorporated uh, plants like ayahuasca in their, their spiritual practice, the psychedelic renaissance, uh, the medicalization, and all these different worlds, they have these substances in common, but they're very different worlds. No? And, and so um, these are this, this space is a space where all these different perspectives come together and challenge each other, and where you know a single botanical species can really invite a multitude of disciplines to talk to each other and to find new ways to uh, you know to connect to interconnect. Uh, you know, d disciplines like um, human rights, drug policy, science, uh, ecology, uh, indigenous rights, you know, all of these aspects really surround these plants and it's in this space uh, that all of these come together, no? Um, you know, and, and also these, in that space is really where also the different uh, cultural, uh, you know, the cultural differences and the uh, social values and worldviews of these different worlds really clash sometimes. Um, and it's sometimes difficult, no? And there's a globalization of these plant practices that exist for so long. Uh, you know, how do indigenous peoples feel about the medicalization? You know, where are things going? Uh, you know, and that's, it's a bit from that space that I'm going to talk uh, today. And so the first time I got in touch... Oh, sorry. The first, the first time I got in touch uh, with this uh, space was when I was a young filmmaker. Uh, and I started making a documentary about Ibogaine. This was in uh, 2001, when I met uh, this man called Howard Lotsoff. He discovered uh, Ibogaine's anti-addictive properties. Uh, by coincidence, he, he and seven friends tried Ibogaine as a psychedelic, thought they were going to have a psychedelic trip, and the next day they didn't have withdrawal. The experience was not pleasant at all, but they basically discovered that Ibogaine really was effective to blocking opiate withdrawal and helping people out of uh, addiction. And so he opened the door to a really incredible medical subculture uh, around Ibogaine. I met so many people uh, who had been drug dependent for a very long time, sometimes 20 years, had been really broken and then through their encounter with this plant had come out of, uh, you know, I was there suffering. And, and many of them then really started dedicating their lives to help others. So they learned from each other how to work with Ibogaine. They measured the doses in, milli, in milligrams. Some had uh, you know, monitored vitals, others didn't. Some were very well trained, others didn't. But there was really this subculture that I, I got into. And I saw how many of the people that I filmed during this process of the film were socially very deprived. They were on the verge of just losing their family, uh, their communities. Uh, and just you know, trying to hold on to that and not lose everything they got into Ibogaine. No? Um, it was very clear also that it was not a very integrated practice. It was very stigmatized. It was, Ibogaine has always been the black sheep of the psychedelics world and also of the harm reduction world. And you know, there's, it's been always a bit of this crazy plant and uh, without uh, clinical trials that didn't really advance very much. But I got very deep into this, this community, and I thought I, I really you know, saw what Ibogaine was about. Until three years later, in the process of making the film, I ended up in this village in Mitone, in Gabon, of uh, Antoine, who's a tribe leader. And they opened the door to their culture, the same plant, uh, but a completely different culture, a completely different society, and seeing how they were using um, Ibogaine, or Iboga. And in this community, almost all men were initiated at the age of 14, some even seven years old, as young as seven years old. Women were initiated only when they needed healing, because they, they believed that the giving birth for the first time is the rite of passage of the, of the women. Um, and there, Iboga is a completely integrated practice for millennia in the Buiti. And so what followed, and this is a fragment of my documentary, was a five-day uh, process, a death rebirth process, a, a rite of passage of this one woman that was accompanied by about 30 people over the course of these five days, all of them supporting her going through her uh, rite of passage. Um, they really witnessed how she, and they, they supported how she 
went back to the world of the dead of the ancestors to get new knowledge from that world and then come back as a Bwiti initiate with a new name, um, a Bwiti name, coming back to use that knowledge to become again a functional uh, person in the, in the community. Um, this is the f was the first time I got in touch with a culture that really had integrated and, and, and held sacred these practices for all this time, no? And passed on all that knowledge from generation to generation. And, you know, it was really incredible to see the, the, the difference. Um, obviously, it's a completely different culture. They have a different worldview. But for me, the most striking thing was that here, the whole community, you know, they understood that the, the problem of this one person was not just an individual problem. It was a problem of the whole community. And so they were all there to reintegrate that person. While in, in, in Mexico, in, in um, Holland, and in Canada, where I filmed uh, initiation or treatment for drug dependence, See, there was no loved one uh, anywhere nearby, you know, and even often the family had no idea that the person was going through treatment. Um, and well, very often the, the addiction had started because of family-related issues. And afterwards, it's a matter of seeing how long they can maintain uh, abstinence. You know? So this was a completely different reality. Um, and so since that time, when I finished the film, I started to do public speaking uh, with my film. And then so at the end, I decided to start a foundation uh, called ICIRS. Uh, and since that time, we've been very much working you know, within this space in between the indigenous world, between the religious uh, groups, and then our, uh, in the global north, the integration of these plants. And it's needless to say that when an ancient practice uh, you know, globalizes and then bumps into this much younger drug control system and in a society that really has, has demonized almost these altered states, that that's a very, very complicated um, situation no? uh, and, f and phenomena. So, so that's really what we're, um, we're, working, we're working around. And um, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, um, just sorry. Uh, yeah, so a, a few weeks ago I had a conversation with somebody and uh, he's very prominent in the psychedelics world. And he said, you know, I'm very happy that for me uh, LSD is my sacrament because, you know, I, de I really don't need to deal with all these culture clashes and all the difficulties that come from that. And indeed, it's, you know, it's, it can really look at something not very nice when, when there's cultures and when you talk to indigenous peoples and be in, the, in between that space. But I think if we really take the time to listen to these different perspectives, see how they challenge each other, how they come together, that we can get a lot of, um, you know, of guidance and inspiration in how to, where to lead these practices and how to properly integrate them in our global uh, society now. No? And not just have a pure medicalized model, but really think of you know, how can we do that? And, and not just uh, you know, serve the individual's needs, but also maybe transform some of the underlying uh, aspects uh, you know, of, of, our, um, of our society. And so you know, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's in, in between that space that really I think you know, we need to, to take time and, and give space to that and then see you know, what models can we come up with uh, for the, the, and, and maintain the systems that already have existed for so long and give them space in our, our society. So I just want to first go to uh, the, the UN. This is the ivory tower of the drug control system in Vienna. If you ever want to have a, you know, a go to a depressing place, I really highly recommend to go there. Uh, I went there once. My colleagues go there every year for the Commission on Narcotics Drugs. Um, you know, and uh, basically in the last edition, there's always a dialogue with NGOs, with the heads of the drug control bodies. And in the last one, we asked, so what about, uh, you know, the drug control system uh, granting the rights to indigenous communities that have been using these plants for so long and that contain uh, scheduled alkaloids? And the, the head of the INCB, the International Narcotics Control Board, responded that governments had had enough time to uh, basically bring indigenous peoples back to normality. So they considered all these practices not being normal. No? And, and so that's really the mentality that we're, we're dealing with. At the same time, the hopeful thing is that uh, the civil society, the progressive side of civil society, the NGOs like us who defend you know, the end of, of uh, criminalization of, of people using these substances uh, are now becoming dominant. Uh, for the first time ever, the head of the, the democratically elected head of the NGO representative body there uh, is a very progressive person. No? And so I think there's, there's hope, uh, but it, we still need to be there very present and change things. 
And then, and I think, and this is strategically uh, very important to uh, to realize is that at the UN level, even though they're very conservative, they really c clearly state that the drug control, uh, the, the drug conventions, should be interpreted in a way that the plants, ayahuasca, peyote, San Pedro, mushrooms, uh, iboga, that they are not illegal. They are not. They don't fall under the uh, drug conventions. But that when you extract the molecules, mescaline, DMT, uh, psilocybin, and so forth, that those molecules are illegal. So they make a clear distinction between the both. And, and so at the UN level, all of these plants uh, are not scheduled. Um, and most people don't know this. No, everybody saying all these, these plants are illegal everywhere around the world. Actually, that's not the case. And so what they say is that uh, countries can have more stricter uh, bans than the drug, control, the drug conventions. Uh, so some countries have stricter bans. France banned ayahuasca in 2005, for example, but many countries don't have specific uh, laws that ban these plants. So in most parts of the world, actually, uh, there's a lot of confusion and there's actually an opening to defend the fact that we're not talking about scheduled substances here. Uh, and so we work a lot around that, that opening. No? And, and that comes be exactly because of the fact that these plants come from these traditions that the UN member states uh, have recognized these plants as cultural practices. They, they really are important for their cultures. So if they would ban these plants, they would really ban the, the, the sacred plants of these cultures. And that's why this is not the case. Um, and then, obviously, we have also human rights. This is the, are the human rights bodies of the UN in Geneva. Uh, and there's, for example, something like the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is signed by many UN member states, which says that all uh, indigenous peoples should have access to their uh, traditional medicine. They also recognize the, the right for religious freedom, for the highest attainable standard of health, and for many other things. And it is also when this plant medicine globalized that the, the, the tensions between the drug control system and the human rights can really be uh, put to, to taken to the surface. And an example of that is that in Holland, in the last uh, few, two years, two indigenous leaders were arrested with a bottle of ayahuasca. One was Benki, who is a Ashaninka leader from Brazil, and the other one was Taita Floro, a Colombian uh, healer. So, you know, coming into Holland with one bottle of ayahuasca, their, their feathers were taken away, their symbol of leadership uh, and knowledge in their community, their, their traditional medicine was taken away. And, you know, that, and that's, that's, you know, it's a horrible, shameful situation no, where, where that happens. So uh, we were involved in, in the defense of, of uh, um, both cases. At the end, the government, the, the prosecutor didn't pick the case. They dropped, they dropped the case, which for them is fantastic. At the same time, it's a, you know, almost a pity because if, if they would pick a case like that, you really can bring in all the artillery you know, to bring all of these uh, you know, problems and tensions between those systems uh, to the surface. No? Um, so, and we all know that, that drug, the drug conventions and the drug uh, control system has, has done a very poor job to, um, you know, respect human, um, human rights. So, I just for those interested, want to point this document out. This is a new document that came out in, in uh, March. Uh, it's the International Guidelines on Human Rights and Drug Policy, which was developed by the um, International Center on, on Human Rights and Drug Policy at Essex University. And they did a whole stakeholder engagement. Uh, we participated in that, and we uh, brought in a lot of the, the perspectives on the use of these traditional psychoactive plants uh, in a globalized context. And the end result uh, is really incredible. And it's signed, you know, it's the World Health Organization was involved, the UNDP, the, the Development Program, UNAIDS. And they presented it in the last uh, uh, session in, in Vienna. And I think this is going to be a very important tool as we had continue to do advocacy work and, and legal work, um, you know, because they really say they, they recommend for the drug control system to really respect those uh, rights, uh, religious rights, you know, rights of indigenous peoples and, and other rights related to these practices. So, so that's good news and we hope to continue working with this document. So we, we've been a, a lot involved in legal defense. I just want to give you a little touch on the situation in that sense. So even though at the UN level uh, these plants are not illegal, and many countries have no specific uh, laws that ban these plants, uh, you can see that uh, from 1999 to 2008, the cases that we are aware of, I'm sure there's more, was 10 cases. 
well, in the last decade that went up to, and now this is 147, but now we're uh, way over that. The last months there have been a lot of new cases. Um, Spain is the country, Spain, Barcelona is where we are based. It's actually the country with most arrests, but also interesting to say that nobody was convicted except for one person who declared guilty. Um, but nobody was convicted. So, you know, it doesn't mean that there's a lot of incidents. That means there's a lot of uh, people that are actually convicted. The U.S. is in the second place. Also, in the last year, we've been involved in four cases that ended up actually pretty positively. Uh, and it goes down. Also, of all of these countries, many of them have no specific ban of these plants. Uh, and so the argument is always the same. They say, this is DMT, this is an excuse to drug people, and they completely, uh, literally extract DMT out of a very complex uh, cultural practice uh, that involves many things. No? And we try to really contextualize and put this case uh, into perspective. Uh, and so when we saw that this, in 2010, this wave came up, we uh, decided we already had been involved in legal defense since 2010, but then 2014, we decided to professionalize that. Uh, we set up the Ayahuasca Defense Fund. We called it Ayahuasca because most of the cases that came to us was Ayahuasca, but now you know, we've also served uh, some San Pedro cases, peyote, iboga, uh, mushrooms, but more like ceremonial use of mushrooms, and then also um, mambe, the traditional coca preparations. And the idea behind it was really to create a, a network, international network of solidarity with the community uh, and, and really gather uh, expertise. We brought together uh, the lawyers who had successfully defended cases, uh, academics, you know, professionals, and just and built this, this project that's been ongoing now for a couple of years. Um, and uh, we see that each case is really an opportunity to set a positive precedent and, and at, at least avoid a negative precedent, but also to really educate judges, the journalists who cover those cases, ambassadors when sometimes a citizen of a foreign country is arrested, and so forth. And you know, this was the first case we, we got involved in, and, and the experience has been really very interesting. Generally, when a case like this comes to a judge, they're very confused. They're not used to having a person with some feathers talking about spirituality sitting in front of them. You know? And they're very used, they're used to like hardcore drug trafficking, you know, guns, money, and then all of a sudden this is in front of them. So they're pretty lost in the beginning and they very much listen to expertise. So we have gone as expert witnesses to many of those, those cases. Um, and what you see is that in countries where if this would be considered, say, a hard drug, Schedule One drug, uh, this could be 10 years of prison or more. Uh, but through the, this right defense, uh, it's been possible to come to a plea bargain, to an agreement where the judge really has things not very clear and says, I don't want to send anybody to jail. Let's do a bit of community work, and that's the end of it. Uh, we have seen where judges recognize that actually these plans are not illegal, or at least it's not clear. In some of the cases, they recognized that it actually had been very beneficial for the participants. Um, they recognized that science shows that it's not a threat to public health. And in one case, the judge ended up drinking ayahuasca when the case was closed. So I think the defense did a better job than the prosecution. And so what we see now is a bit of a, um, you know, a, a new struggle because you know, an example of a poorly defended case and how that can set a very problematic precedent is something that happened in Holland. Uh, there was a, a church, a small group, who um, you know, had, had lost the case. They were arrested, they had a case, they lost, and they decided to bring their case to the European Court of Human Rights, a very big court. Uh, they were totally unprepared. They had no idea. They had no good arguments. They had no good legal representation. Everybody advised them not to do it, but they did it anyways. And at the end, the court didn't accept the case, uh, but they filed a, a report of inadmissibility in which they basically say that the threat to public health of ayahuasca is far greater than the right to religious freedom, um, which is no scientific basis at all in their report, but that's their claim. No? So that's now a new narrative they threw out there. Also, the International Narcotics Control Board, even though they recognize these plans are not illegal, in 2010 and 12, they already in their report said that the, the increasing popularity of these practices is a threat to public health. They talk about all tourism to Peru and other places is fake spiritual tourism. Um, you know, and they, they claim that all use outside of the traditional context is recreational, abusive, and problematic. Um, so, you know, 
what we decided to do is because there's very little research about the reality of use observational research that looks at uh, public health and looks really at this phenomenon of of, um, um, of the uh, ayahuasca tourism. So we did a large study at the Temple of the Way of Light, it's one of the largest uh, Peruvian centers that receives people from all around the world. And for over three years, we have been enrolling people and we have been looking at demographics, motivation. Also, we've been following them for a year, uh, looking at quality of life. Uh, there's a therapeutic group, people coming in for, for grief, PTSD, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and people coming in from, for more spiritual personal development practice. So we have been looking into what is, does this do, this practice, this tourism with these people. And I just want to share one slide. In the next year, there's going to be several publications coming out of that study. But we saw that on 661 participants, nobody you know, came in for recreational uses. Uh, most of them came in for spiritual uh, uses or, or personal development, and then about 28% or so to, to treat the pathology for medical uh, reasons. The average age was also 39. These were people who generally had their life kind of on track, but wanted to improve something, or they had problems and they wanted to heal that. So, and then the other uh, study we did, which, which we published this year, uh, was in Spain. We assessed uh, 380 ayahuasca uh, drinkers, people who more or less regularly participated in ceremonies in different contexts, from religious groups to more shamanic or uh, neo-shamanic uh, communities. And we used the, the public health indicators that the government uses to assess the, the health, the coping mechanisms, and the lifestyle of the general population. So we, we, we made a, an assessment, and we did that in person, and we assessed 380 people, and we saw that they actually have, tend to have better coping mechanisms than the general population. Um, they have you know, a, a very healthy lifestyle generally, and they have a good subjective uh, health. And we didn't conclude that that was because of the ayahuasca. We, include, we interpreted this the other way around. We, we thought this, this shows that ayahuasca can be uh, properly integrated in community context and not be, be a threat to public health and even be beneficial to the people in those communities. Um, and so our, our hope is now to start to export this type of study to other countries and really get uh, high, you know, big samples uh, looking, using always the uh, public health indicators of these specific countries and then be able to uh, get all of that knowledge together as an argument uh, you know, against this idea that this is a threat to public health. Uh, and we see that now, you know, as this becomes more, more known, also more incidents tend to happen. You know, there's bad practice, there's opportunism, uh, some incidents happen, and those incidents always are completely blown out of proportion, never contextualized. And so this type of research, I think, is cru crucial to really be able to contextualize that. So after the ivory tower of the UN and the, and the cold courtrooms uh, you know, around the world where we've been working, I just want to go down now for a moment to the, the depth of the, the humid um, you know, uh, jungle of, of Colombia. This is the Putumayo region in Colombia. I was just there a month ago. I'm still integrating. Um, and this was with an organization called UMIAC, the Union of uh, Indigenous Yaje, Ayahuasca Medics of the Colombian Amazon. It's a grassroots uh, indigenous organization. Uh, and they contacted us two years ago. And they were looking for partners uh, internationally with whom to establish a horizontal relationship of mutual strengthening. And we really love that idea. What knowledge do we have to offer to them? We help them, you know, how do you develop a fundraise plan? How do you do organizational development? And they really teach us about how ayahuasca is used in those communities. And then hopefully out of that, some things we can learn to bring to the global north. Um, this community is Osokocha, and that's where the leadership of Umiak uh, lives. And so after two years of, of working with them on a distance and doing events together, our first collaboration was actually bringing five of those leaders to the UN in, in Geneva. Uh, it was time for us to go to those communities. You know? and with the generous support of Dr. Bronner's and, and the River Sticks Foundations, we managed to, to go there a month ago and really have several ceremonies in different communities and see how they really use this in, in ceremony. And I'd been in this region 12 years earlier. I drank with the Kofan for the first time. But I never drank in an entire community and saw how all these things are played out. Um, and so I want to share a few of my experience or insights in how they use Yahe in those communities and see if maybe we can translate some of that to our, our communities here. 
Um, so important to say is that three days before we came to this community, the father of, the, of our two hosts, of the leadership of the, the Umiak, uh, died from a brain uh, injury, like an uh, aneurysm. Uh, this was the fifth death of that community in one year. It's a community of 150 people. Three were massacred uh, six months earlier. One uh, died in an accident, and now this person three days before we went. So we thought they might cancel everything, but they didn't for us. Our visit was very important. So we, we went and we, we were welcomed so generously in this community, the door went wide open. Uh, but this was a community in full grief. Um, and every day they were all grieving together. And they did this ceremony. So this, this ceremony, the first night, was really the presentation of us, of ICERs, also to those communities. It was what they call the Minga de Pensamientos. It's kind of a meeting of thought, of, of weaving thought together. Uh, that's the way they, they think about meetings. So we all drank yaje. It was immediately clear that in those commu communities, the ayahuasca is not about the individual. It's all about the entire community. And the, the Maloka was filling up with little children, five years old, to the elderly, all together. Um, the, it was so full that they had to say to uh, mostly children at the end that they couldn't drink that night and you know, had to pass. So as the night started, um, it was incredible. It was the first time that they actually were all in a ceremony. People were talking to each other, some from the fire in the middle, sharing things with the whole group. There were discussions going on. And I was placed next to the Taita and the, and the leader of Umiak uh, in a hammock, drinking a hammock. And I could hear all the conversations and participate. And so I could immediately see that they use these spaces. These are the community spaces where they address community problems, where they look for solutions together, where they celebrate life. Half of the night they were laughing and making jokes and really celebrating, which on first sight can look disrespectful. No, this is a spiritual practice. People should be inside. and. But they, you know, the celebration of life and humor is really a big part of, of these communities. And then right after laughing for, you know, with, a, with a funny joke, they start talking about the massacre that happened six months ago and how they need to advance with that and what they need to do. And one moment, the head of the tribe said, you know, there's this neighboring community that's starting to negotiate with the oil companies because they have the right to negotiate with oil companies when they want to come in. And then the companies promise many false promises, you know, money, whatever it is to allow them in. So they, that they were negotiating and they said, we have to do a ceremony with them, drink three cups, big cups of yahe, so that the people negotiating can really feel and experience the death and destruction that they're creating now in 100 years. So they really use the ayahuasca to connect to those issues and to look for solutions. Then at some point, they all started to talk about the father who just died. They, they made music. They, they celebrated the legacy that he has left and shared the teachings and make sure that the teachings of the father of, that, of those two or, or few brothers was also the teachings for the entire community and that all that knowledge was preserved. And then very interestingly, at some point in the middle of the night, one, uh, one uh, little girl, she was maybe 12 or, or 13 years old, started to shout. She had a bit of a panic attack. You know? We're like, wow, what's going on? They didn't seem to be very bothered. Um, you know, they let it happen for a while, and then the Taita starts singing, and then the whole thing calmed down. And then the, the next girl, and the next day they, they explained that these were two of the kids that were told not to come to the ceremony because it was full, but that, that they are rebels. They don't listen to uh, the elders. They don't actively participate in the community. They, they have to, you all hear me like this? Yeah. yeah. They, and so um, they, you know, they, they were not,
said that you can look at the maturity of a, of a society in the way they treat their elders and their, their kids. And I was extremely impressed on how they, they treat the elders. It's not uncommon in most cultures, even though there's contamination of fumigations on the, the coca plant plantations, there's oil, there's, you know, there's so much pollution and stuff going on. But still, the elders, they, they reach very often more than 180 years old, and he was not the oldest Taita that's part of this Umuyak network. Um, so he was leading the ceremony, he was doing healings, he was harmonizing, uh, but it was not just him, it was also his son was, uh, and, and, and his grandson and other uh, you know, people they call followers of the medicine. They're not called titans because titans are the elders. Followers of the medicine are shamans in training, and the training is a whole life, it never ends with the training. So in a way they were co leading the ceremony, it was not only it was, it was the community leading together. And the, the elders not leading out of this mentality that now, before everything was good and now it's all, you know, fact that the young, you know, the young kids, they don't learn anymore, you know, that type of mentality, you don't see that. that. They're really invested in the, in the young generations. And until the day they die, they, their role is to really pass on life experience uh, and, and make sure that they don't lose the connection to the values, the human connection that they have got from generation to generation under the influence of the technology and Cities and have a certificate that was recognized. So, uh, yeah. that was recognized. Um, you know, so you think that's an amazing thing. Now, these traditional indigenous healers, they're recognized as official healers also outside of the, those cultures. But there was a side effect that started coming. So, they, now, you know, healers would go to the cities, they would start doing ceremonies, they would get more money in the, in the cities, they would become famous. They would start getting following some, you know, women really getting feeling attracted to them, and then they're abusing, and they start to be uh, sexual misconduct, power dynamics, and at the same time losing the, completely the connection with their their territories. You no, know? and I thought a lot about us wanting to bring the real shamans to to the West. I mean, these these are community leaders, and they have to be in their communities. So if you take them out and you bring them here, who's going to make sure that those communities are not being weakened and, and destroyed? So what they told me is that they, they don't believe at all in, in papers, certificates. So they said the only real certification is the continued accountability to the community. And I thought, you know, that's, that's really, you know, fascinating because if we think about where it goes wrong as these plant, uh, plants globalize, you know, the misconduct uh, where we hear more and more, uh, uh, unfortunately, of uh, gurus and people really having power dynamics over their followers. Really, a lot of it is people traveling, not being really part and accountable to a community, uh, becoming famous, you know, and losing really touch with, with that, that accountability. Um, so I thought that was, uh, you know, a lot of wisdom and maybe thinking about how can we make sure that people who work with those plants here also have to be accountable in a continuous way to the community. So this was the man of 110 years old, Taita Tarsesio. And you could see that it was not just him leading, but also all of these are, are shamans in, in training, no? the followers of the medicine, all singing at some point together different, different songs, but all kind of harmonizing. So, you know, if we think about how can we, we have, we have the medical, uh, the medicalization is very much on track, no? and I really want to honor the organizations, MAPS, Hefter, you know, Beckley, uh, all the organizations who have worked for so many years to really push that forward, because it's not, without, without them we would not be in a situation where we are now, where a lot of the fear uh, towards these substances has been taken away, you know? And as that further evolves and, and these become prescription medications or treatments in our, in our society, what can we do to make sure that some of these other uh, systems of use can also be, be uh, you know, fully legally uh, um, you know, integrated and in a way where there is this accountability you know, and, and good practice? 
And also I thought, you know, can we find ways to, to integrate them where they go beyond just, you know, trying to, uh, you know, get a new spark of life in a person with a depression or detox somebody with a drug dependency and then see how long they can maintain, but really use the ayahuasca or the, the plant medicine as a conduit to create community, to reintegrate people in their communities or to create new communities where people can become a, a member of, no? And so, you know, I think it's... Uh, I important to um, to really you know focus on 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 uh, on, on places or situations locally like the, the local realities where we can get different leaders from different traditions uh, integrated with that community and then f looking for trans uh, mechanisms of transparency um, you know and and and, and creating good uh, uh, safe containers for these practices to happen um, so. I, I want to go a little bit to, to Spain, to our backyard. We have our office in Barcelona, and we have, uh, I think, in relevant experience for very long that's now becoming more relevant to the rest of the world that maybe can provide a bit of a framework for the use of these more cultural, spiritual, and personal growth uses of these plants in other parts of the world. So, so in Spain, um, you know, drugs, for the use of drugs, any drug for personal use or the possession for personal use has never been a crime. How many of you knew that before? See, everybody talks always about Portugal, and that's because Portugal had a very strict drug control system and then they completely changed it. But in Spain, that's never been the case. So we're the country with the longest history of uh, non-criminal uh, drug policy. And so we've seen what type of uh, opportunities that can also uh, develop. And also interesting is that now the opioid crisis is fully going on in the U.S. No, with incredible amounts of uh, people overdosing every year. Uh, so we had a, in Spain. I'm not Spanish. I'm from Belgium. But uh, you know, in, in Spain, uh, in the 80s, there was a big heroin epidemic. Um, and so it was the country of Europe with most overdoses, most HIV, and most hepatitis C infections. And because it got so bad, the, the grassroots movements they came together and they really pushed for uh, complete change in. Uh, not the fact that it was a crime to use drugs, but you know, moving towards a harm reduction model. And we have in, in Catalonia the, some of the best harm reduction in the, in the world. Uh, we have only in Barcelona, a city of 1.5 million people, 12 safe injection and, and smoking sites for crack and heroin and so forth. Uh, you know, the US, I think there's none in the, in the whole country. Maybe now it's coming because so many people are dying. But very interestingly is that um, in the 80s, at some point, Somebody who was dependent on heroin went and um, you know got um, you know bought heroin for him and his friends. He collected money from all of them, went to buy it, came back and he was arrested. And they said you're a drug dealer, and he went all the way to the Supreme Court, and they recognized that he was not a drug dealer. That what he had done was a collective purchase. So not only in Spain uh, do they recognize uh, is the use personal use of drugs not a crime, but also they recognize that if users, drug users, get together and organize to buy their drugs and use their drugs together, that's called co shared personal use, collective personal use. So that is that is given. Um, sorry, that is given. Um, you know, place to uh, innovation. Uh, that was really born out of this necessity of people dying uh, there, no? And this was a report we wrote for the Open Society Foundations. If you Google this title, you can find it and read all about uh, the policy there. But one thing it did was that uh, cannabis users started to associate. They started to build uh, associations of cannabis users based on this fact that it's not a crime. Cannabis is illegal in Spain, but it's not a crime to personally use it. And they start to organize this collective uh, shared user associations. These are private, non non-profit user associations. Even though there's abuse of that model, uh, part of them are really, you know, having a like a black money. You know, they're not well done, but there's a big activist uh, initiative behind it, and they really have started to federate. They self-regulated as well, and now this whole process where this model is becoming fully regulated, and so. We've been very actively working around this cannabis social uh, uh, club model in Spain. Uh, but then we, have, we figured, can we take this model and adjust it to the use of this plant medicine? Because really, in the, if you talk about ayahuasca mostly, uh, but also peyote and San Pedro, people come together, they sit in circle, and they use it together. So it is a shared use of a plant. 
uh, which technically is not illegal, but if you would consider it illegal, uh, you know, this is shared personal use. And there's a, a, a pioneering uh, organization that started this. They applied, uh, they're called Asociación Maloca. Uh, and they're est established as an association, non-profit association, and they've been doing ceremonies, inviting Brazilian shamans doing uh, with local uh, facilitator ceremonies now for several years. Um, and um, you know, and they have been. Uh, they had two incidents where ayahuasca was stopped at the border. The first one led to a court case, which they historically won. We were also very involved in that. Uh, the judge, you know, said maybe instead of criminalizing these practices, we should start regulating them. And they recognized it was not illegal in Spain. And since then, all the new arrests and there, there they happen, uh, all, all have been dropped. And this this document has been key. We additionally. Um, hired the, the top level um, law, a criminal law professor of Malaga, asked him to do an analysis, in-depth analysis of the legal status on the UN level and at the, at the national level. And his conclusion is that it's not illegal. And so that together now is really uh, given a higher layer of protection in Spain. And we're now, we have translated that document and now are trying to make adaptations for other countries where those no, there's no specific laws banning these plants. So that they're also, instead of thinking we need to legalize them, we need to really consolidate this idea that they are not illegal in the first place and should not be considered uh, illegal. Um, so, and uh, before I go here, uh, um, one more thing I wanted to, to share about that. Let me just follow here. Uh, the, the good thing about these association models is that they can take several forms. It's important they're non-profit. There's, there should be uh, financial transparency. Um, you know, we've been working also on how we can really envision ideal, responsible context, having an emergency pl plan in place, you know, good information to members and so forth. But the good thing is they can be different forms of association. So they can be a cultural association, but they could also be a patient association. So say, imagine Randy, another vet who was here sharing his story and of, of trauma and with MDMA is healing. So imagine there could, th those type of people could then become a member of a, of a patient association. Uh, where they, they really like in, in Colombia can you know share their problems, can celebrate life together. You know if somebody died, they can grieve together. They can really you know hold each other and become a, get a support structure um, and, and really be part of that community and also do ceremonies together within that context. No. Uh, or, you know, it could be uh, just an extended family association where we all together, we live in the same place, we want to do our ceremonies, we want to integrate those practices in our communities. You know, this is a model which could uh, allow that. Um, also, Deborah, who spoke uh, a few days ago about grief and ayahuasca, she set up uh, that type of association several years ago with the focus to advance research. So this is more people who want to you know, do experiments with psychedelics and then be able to research that and publish. So uh, scientific uh, papers have come out of that. So it can really, the focus can be different, but it's important, it's non-profit, it's a user association, uh, and it, there should be a, um, you know, a good safety container and transparency. So you can, you can see that in our work, community has been, you know, become an important part in the, in the public uh, health research we started doing uh, in working, you know, around this association community model and with the indigenous communities. The other thing we have been doing, and this picture is fr from a Catalan uh, uh, cultural practice called the Human Towers, where the, they climb on top of each other, uh, eight stories high, 10 meters high with little kids on top with helmets. Uh, you know, and if you look at it from, from the top, you can see that they can really defy gravity and they can do incredible things because they all have the same vision. They're all aligned, perfectly aligned to su sustain that tower building up. And we figured that in the plant, practice, uh, plant practitioners' communities, people are not aligned at all. And why is that? Because in some countries it's illegal, in many others it's not very clear, there's legal uncertainty, they're afraid. So information is not flowing. People learn a lot in all of these groups, all of these ayahuasca circles, iboga practitioners, you know, peyote circles and so forth. They accumulate a lot of knowledge because they're doing this every day. Uh, sometimes they have adverse situations they have to deal with, uh, challenges, the best things that work very well, but they don't share that. It all stays in each group. And so when that information doesn't flow, they, they do not lift um, you know, the, the practice altogether. So we figured we need to do something uh, about this as well. And, and, and can we seed processes 
uh, of basically them coming to a line, a line behind the common vision for strategy to move forward. Uh, you know, a common vision and a sense of, of common resp of collective responsibility that when there's problematic practitioners, they really can do something about that. Whole Making people aware. Hello, now, maybe a little bit. No? So, so making people aware, uh, you know, about the, the the great value that's in it for them to associate with the others and really collectively elevate this. And so, and this is something which has happened before in other collectives, no? Um, the, the uniting, the alignment of communities. And the person in the organization who leads this project has talked to several other uh, groups. One is in California, the Chinese Medicine Collective, who had also at some point started to associate all together, they started to figure out what is our common ground, what do we consider good practice, what do we consider outside of the scope. And then they start to they, they start to uh, really connect to the authorities, and at some point manage to f get this fully regulated. But the way that they suggested it would be regulated, and the first battle they fought was with the medical establishment, actually, who said we are the we are the logical people to do Chinese medicine, but they they said no, then you would have to do seven years of, of uh, school because it is a whole different uh, medical system. Um, so, so the last thing I want to share um, is, um, you know, going back to the indigenous communities, one other key part that really struck me uh, was in a ceremony which was called the Health Brigade, where they bring the Taitas to a community uh, where, um, you know, they, they need healing. And I thought this would all be individual healing. And this is a service that Umiak brings to all of these, these communities. So we ended up in a community of about uh, 80 people or so. And what I realized is what they're doing is they're not just healing individuals, they're healing the fractures of the community. Uh, some of them were negotiating with oil companies, the, the other didn't want that, there were big fights in the community, they were healing that. And at the same time, what they consider is that the individual health, the collective, the community health, and the health of the territory is one and the same thing, and you cannot uh, take that apart. And that might sound strange at first sight, but actually it's so logic. No? If, if you pollute your, your soil with oil or you know, with, with uh, pesticides, the, your community is going to get ill and the individuals are going to get ill. And if the community is fractured and they, they can lose the connection with the, with the land and they might allow oil companies to come in no? and not resist against that and understand that if they do that, they're really, it's going to be damaging for all the generations to come. Um, so, you know, thinking about that, how that's all the same, and thinking about the advancements that we're making with the psychedelic, the psychedelic you know, the drug development, and, and as they're integrating in our communities, I think that's really a key, key thing to keep in mind. You know, psychedelics that are waking us up to the interconnectedness of all life. How do we make sure that it's not, there's not a disconnection to, to the land you know, and to the environmental situation? As we are here celebrating life at, at, um, at Burning Man, uh, all of you probably know that the Amazon is completely burning. No? And most of the places where these fires were started was in indigenous land. Uh, the indigenous peoples are the protectors of the land. 
Um, and it's by making those communities weak that the Amazon can be completely sold to corporate interest. Uh, that's why, for me, it was so inspiring to go to Colombia and see Umiak working to unite all of these uh, communities, 22 co communities of diff five different etnias, all together in resistance uh, against this, this exploitation. And more so, nobody knows really that in Africa, Central West Africa, or Central Africa, is completely burning. Like, if you look at the map, the Amazon is really almost nothing compared to what's going on in, in Africa. You know, so as we are, all, you know, we're grieving for all the loss of everything that's being burnt in, in nature, and and places where these plants that we are now, you know, bringing to in, in the global north to people here for their benefit, uh, the, the the places of origin are really burning and people are dying, um, and. And you know, in the communities where I went, I said earlier that there was a massacre uh, t six months earlier in one of the communities. Three, three men were killed. In the other community we went, in 2017, the leader of Umiak was killed. Uh, and this is a land which is full of oil under the, the soil. Uh, two two uh, weeks before our last World Ayahuasca Conference, a month, two months ago, uh, there was an attempt to kill two women leaders. Uh, that, that failed, uh, and now just recently in Colombia, five, I think five uh, leaders of another community were killed in a few days' uh, time. No, so that's the reality that these people are living uh, every day. And so, you know, I really want to invite all of us and all of us involved in psychedelics here to really think about that and, 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 and think how, how can we make sure that the needs that we have here uh, for people dependent on opioids, as we try to make Ibogaine available, Iboga available, uh, making sure that the needs of those people go hand in hand with uh, responding to the needs of the Buiti communities in Gabon, um, you know, or, or ayahuasca has it been uh, developed? You know, how how can we make sure that that really also has a positive impact and and strengthening the communities in in the Amazon? So. Um, my film, I finished my film in, in my Abergin film in 2004. Ten years later, I, I discovered, or, or news started to come, that Iboga was, uh, there was a shortage of Iboga in, in Gabon. Uh, you know, I, felt, I didn't feel completely directly responsible, but I definitely felt responsible. Uh, there's more factors to that, no? And I'm worried now that more films are coming out, Iboga is more known. Uh, you know, are we, for our needs, depleting now again? Are we doing spiritual extractionism and depleting, you know, the, the, the rainforest in, in Gabon and taking the boga from the indigenous communities? So, um, you know, the last thing I want to share is that I, I think it's very important that we all work in an ecosystems approach um, and, you know, where, where the, the development of, of psychedelic plants in our context really, you know, takes into account and the people making the movies and those doing advocacy work really take the bigger picture into account. No? And, and with Iboga, we have started an, an engagement project uh, really looking through uh, interviews, through surveys, through uh, expert dialogues, through different forums, and now also, as we speak, a field visit of two months in, in Africa, in Gabon, to look at the local actors, the voices of the indigenous peoples, to see what really are the needs of those communities, what are the challenges we face, what is, what is really what we need to do to push this to the right place, no? And out of that, seeing who are the different actors, the different organizations working, and how we can we all make sure that also, you know, like these human towers in Catalonia, that we also align our, our, st our strategies and really work hand in hand so that all of it is really complementary and that we don't make this, you know, completely know and, and make it into a, a medicine without really solving the, the supply uh, in Gabon and making sure that, uh, you know, the, the globalization of these practices is really in the benefit of all communities involved and society as a whole. Uh, and lastly, I want to invite also those who are at the business, the in investment scope of, the, of uh, psychedelic drug development, that also, you know, they keep this in, in mind, no? and think how can we, as ayahuasca becomes medicalized, or iboga becomes medicalized, in the business plans behind that, that this is taken into account, how can this be a recipro reciprocal uh, business uh, towards the indigenous communities? So I'm gonna leave it here. I don't know if there's some time for questions.